Ellis with your host, Bob Lee. Good morning. I hope you're having a nice weekend. An old friend of mine, a former Tucson lawyer, has this to say about the book written by my guest this morning, and I'm quoting here. Len Sheff has described a path, not an easy one, but a simple one, by which we may move from the gritty and painful drudgery of anger to an elevated freedom. He explains how we can free ourselves from the destructive force of anger at others and at ourselves. This is a book any driven person, any lawyer, any professional, anybody should read and comprehend and as a result become truly alive, end quote. We'll talk with Len Sheff in just a minute. My guest this morning is a Tucson attorney who for the past 15 years has conducted seminars on managing anger. And I don't want to, managing is probably not what I should be saying here. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Um, he's the author of the uh, just published book, The Cow in the Parking Lot. Please meet Leonard Schiff. Len, thank you very much for being with us. Yeah. And we're going to clarify this managing anger in just a minute. But before we, we kind of get into that, how long have you been practicing law here? Well, here, 48 years, and before that, two years in California. So this is my, you know, what do you call it, uh, golden anniversary <laughs> or, or silver anniversary. What do you specialize in? Uh, business and real estate law. That seems like that would be fairly uh, calm uh, as opposed to some of the other stuff you might be dealing with in a courtroom. Well, I don't do a lot of litigation anymore. I'm too old to wake up at 3 in the morning with the perfect cross-examination on my mind. And so I, I try not to go to court. Now, we all have in our mind, I think, the image uh, of what goes on in, in court during a trial or during hearings mm -hmm. or whatever. And it oftentimes seems as if a part of the attorney's persona is, is showing some sort of anger. Um, was that initially how you approached these sort of proceedings? Well, it wasn't showing some anger. I thought being angry was the, what you did as a lawyer. And that was really, really bad. I mean, it doesn't work that way. One of the first lawyers I worked for told me, never be angry unless you're not. <laughs> and so occasionally, you know, you need to put on some anger to get the point across. But if you're acting out of anger, you're not likely to be effective. And what I've learned in the course of this trip is that uh, people don't like angry people. Jurors don't like angry people. Judges don't like angry people, and so on. And so the, you know, the congenial lawyer, I, I think, has the edge. So what, 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 what was going on? At what point did you come to that realization that that, that anger wasn't necessarily working in your favor? Well, uh, in 1993, uh, a group of people whom I'd known uh, got together to bring the Dalai Lama here, and I did the legal work for that. And uh, to reward me, they gave me the front row center seat. So I was sitting not much further from the Dalai Lama than I am from you. And this went on for four days, and it was really difficult because he was talking Tibetan and his translator would translate, and it was very hard to stay focused, and I was not enjoying myself. And when I realized what he was saying is I should give up anger, I thought to myself, this is a very nice man, but he's crazy if he thinks I'm going to give up anger. I'm already angry just having to endure this. <laughs> yeah, and so I left four days of teachings with His Holiness the Dalai Lama with that in my mind. The next night I was out driving, and some guy pulled in front of me, and uh, it was too close, but not dangerous. And I leaned on the horn, and out of his window came the digital sign of disrespect. And I wanted to ram his car, at least give him the sign back, or yell at him. And I said, wait a minute. I just spent four miserable days. Maybe I ought to try this. So I said, what's, what's pushing my buttons here? And I realized that what I wanted was respect from a total stranger. And that, that struck me as amusing. And then I thought about him sticking his uh, finger out the window. 
And I realized it was me giving it meaning. Without me giving it meaning, he might have been checking to see if it was raining. And I cracked up laughing. And I said, holy <laughs> cow, I feel a hell of a lot better now than I did 30 seconds ago. I like this. And it was at that moment I knew exactly what the Dalai Lama had been talking about for four days, not in the detail, but I didn't want to be angry anymore. And I started hard at work on reading and practicing and so on. Now, aren't there certain circumstances, though, where we're showing letting off a little steam is, is, is perhaps a good thing? Well, it certainly is better than keeping it in. Uh, but um, Thich Nhat Hanh said that you know, this old uh, routine where you take a rubber baton and you beat on the pillow and you say, mother, I hate you, or whatever. He said, that's just rehearsing to let out anger um, violently. And so the, the trick is, is you've got to go beyond anger, uh, ultimately to transform it into compassion. And that's a whole different uh, trip. But you're right, if you're going around, you know, sealed up with anger inside you, uh, well, you don't. It comes out somewhere. If you're angry at your boss, uh, you're obviously not going to let your anger out at your boss, but you go home and you get angry at the kids or your wife or the dog. And, and, now you, you, you talk about the Dalai Lama, and, and uh, that somewhere along the line you, can, you converted to Buddhism. What, what led you to make that sort of a commitment? Well, what I was doing, reading and so on, I liked it. And when I sat on a cushion for the first time to meditate, I realized what spiritual meant uh, for the first time. That had never happened to me before. How much time do you spend meditating? Oh, it varies. I, I've done like five-day meditation retreats. I try to sit for now, 20... Is that 24-7? And those retreats, how much, how much... Well, it, it's not what you read about where somebody sits continually. Uh, you sit a, for 25 minutes, and then you get up and do walking meditation for maybe five minutes. Then you sit for 25 minutes until you have a two-hour segment. Then you take two hours off and maybe help cook in the kitchen or something like that. But you don't talk. And so in a sense, it's if you include the movement, it is 24-7 for five days. And it's a very strange but not mystical experience. Uh, and so what you learn is that you don't need all of this entertainment that you think you need. You don't have to be watching TV or eating or chatting with somebody or listening to music. Now we've got to be hoping somebody's listening and watching us right now that we're going to well, you know, I, I don't want to put you Move them business. down the path. <laughs> yeah. uh, I want to talk more about this and you know. uh, talk about the seminars and some other things that you do and, and, and talk about the, the anger management and, and why that's not what you do. And we'll get right. to that in just a minute. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're talking with uh, Len Chef, Tucson attorney, whose new book is called The Cow in the Parking Lot. Um, I, I've used the phrase anger management in several, uh, several notes. Your technique is not anger management. Talk about the two different approaches. Well, um, anger management is sort of a s specific set of techniques. And most of it, the stuff that I've read, and I've tried to read a lot about it, um, there are different routines, maybe 10 or 15 steps to follow when you have an uh, angry situation of this type and another set of that type. And I don't think anybody can remember those. Uh, and so my approach is uh, simple. And I gave you a card with the basic principles on it. Um, and mm -hmm. practically, if you carry that with you when you're angry and you look at it, that's about all you need uh, to get 
past that initial anger rush. Uh, the other thing in anger management is quite frequently they want you to do psychoanalysis. Why am I an angry person? Uh, and go back and see your relationship with your parents and stuff like that. Uh, my there is some validity is not, to that not, though, isn't there? Well, there is and there isn't. Um, because once you know that it, your father made you angry, um, it might put you on alert that that's why you get angry at men or something. Mm -hmm. But mine is much more direct. I shouldn't say mine. Buddhism is much more direct. What is it at this moment that I want that I'm not getting? Uh, respect from a stranger, for instance. And so the first thing that you ask yourself when you're angry is, what is my unmet demand? And that's it. That's the cause of anger. And you say there's four, basically, general unmet demands, correct? Well, there are four types, yes. Yeah. And, and what are they? Well, the simplest one is like when I realized I wanted respect from a stranger. Uh, and that dissolves right there. It was silly. Uh, like, you know, somebody's dividing up a muffin and they take the bigger half. And, you're, and that's the kind where you realize it's just not worth being angry over. That's the second type. And then there's a type where it's entirely reasonable to be angry. Somebody has spilled a plate of spaghetti on your lap or something like that, dropped a brick on your foot. And at that point, you got to ask yourself, what is there to be gained by being angry? Especially if it was an accident. Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, we spend a lot of time, if he did it on purpose, I'm going to be angry. But if it was an accident, I'm not going to be angry. And that doesn't help you. Um, you're not going to reform the person uh, that, that dumped the plate on you on purpose. And so the question is, is do I want to have all of the ill effects of anger? Do I want to wake up at 3 in the morning time after time thinking about that SOB that dumped the plate in my lap? The answer is no. The plate's been dumped in your lap and you can either view it as a silly incident uh, that happened, or you can uh, let it run you around for days, months, years. Uh, I've noticed since doing this work that there are still things that I'm angry about that might have happened to me 30 years ago, and I pull them up and work with them and try to get rid of them. And so the nobody gets over being angry. Um, because anger is a normal human emotion. I've seen the Dalai Lama get angry. But the idea... But how is, would you know? <laughs> well, because he got red in the face yeah. and sweaty and his, the tone of his voice changed. But the um, anger comes out of the amygdala. It's the reptilian part of the brain and sends this huge, strong signal which effectively blocks out the prefrontal cortex and reasoning and analysis. And so what you're doing is you're, you're limited to fleeing or fighting, uh, in effect, uh, vengeance or martyrdom. And um, you, by stopping and saying to yourself, what is the unmet demand, all of a sudden you're lighting up that front of the brain. Unfortunately, the front of the brain hadn't been there as long as the amygdala, and it doesn't send back strong signals. And that's why, as Eric as you said in the quote at the beginning, that um, it's a tough road to overcome the anger. And you're gonna, if you're going to do this, you have to start over and over. Now, the fourth one is chronic anger. And that's where I have a notion that if the whole world behaved like I behaved, it would be a better world. Our people should follow the rules. And so that your rules your way of living, it just, you know, it isn't necessarily right, but if you think it is, then what you've done is you've given yourself an invitation to chronic unhappiness, chronic anger. And so those are the four types. And the first type goes away the minute you realize that you're just being silly. And the second type and so on, it's harder to get rid of. Uh, but when you get rid of the chronic anger, what you do is you unleash your intelligence. Uh, if so your reason, reason takes over? Yeah, yeah. And as I say, it, it takes some work. That, that anger is tough. 
in the book, uh, we say that uh, overcoming anger is like you got a, a guest in your house that's been there forever, and you don't realize you can evict him. The man who came to dinner. Yeah, and furthermore, <laughs> when uh, you deal with somebody else, um, he comes and he screws up <laughs> the deal, and yet you don't evict him. And finally, oh, I can get rid of him, and so you evict him. And so he starts telling you all the reasons why your life is going to go to hell without him, and you might believe him. Or maybe you lock him out, but he sneaks in, you know, through the back door. <laughs> and so over and over again, you have to work at this. But once you've had that basic feeling that I did it, I'm not angry anymore, then you realize what the prize is. And the cement is when you can actually transform anger into compassion. So that the guy that dropped the brick on your foot, whether he did it on purpose or not, um, you understand that he's a miserable human being and you, you have compassion for him. And that replaces the anger. Buddhism believes that people are inherently kind and compassionate. And look at the great leaders that are kind and compassionate, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, uh, all of these people. And look at the people at the uh, Murrow Building in Oklahoma City that forgave Timothy McVeigh and actually asked that he not be executed. So it can be done. And that is a truly magnificent feeling the first time you manage to change anger into compassion. We'll follow up on that and, and uh, talk a little bit more about this and uh, talk about some more things in the book in just a minute. Stay with us. We'll be right back.